we could use NAD boosters, right, to increase the input to our NAD. And so famously, there's NMN, there's NR, you, there's niacin or, or nicotinamide, and right. um, which are all forms of B3, right? Um, yes. Do they, so you had a look, you wrote a paper, you were also on a paper, the quantitative analysis of NAD synthesis, which uh, I looked through and uh, I mean, it's interesting. So what seemed to be the, the outcome was that kind of NMN and NR basically get converted to nicotinamide. And, uh, so, and then nicotinamide is what is used in the cells. Um, so is that correct? And um, would and do NMN and NR actually boost NAD, do you believe? Um, yeah, I mean, they certainly do boost NAD. Um, but our findings from that paper, where when we when we actually trace these molecules given orally, which is the, the main way they've been used, is what we found is what you alluded to that at least a large fraction of the administered dose got converted to nicotinamide before it got used in in, in tissues to make NAD. Um, so you know there is potentially some spillover. I mean, most of these studies people are using very large doses, and uh, you know it may be that the very small amount of intact NR or NMN that gets into the blood and gets to peripheral organs is making a difference. Um, and biochemically, it, you know, it's energetically favorable if you can use one of those molecules, there's a good rationale for thinking those, those would work better in the tissues that they get to because they bypass the step in synthesis that's the most energetically costly and that is feedback regulated. So you kind of jump in you know, one step before you actually make the NAD. Um, right. And you, you know, potentially have a much more favorable path to getting NAD made. Um, but, you know, the, as you alluded to with that paper, the dogma has kind of been that you take these molecules and they, they work just as intended, that they get to all the target tissues and that you take this more favorable path to NAD. And we definitely see that that happens in a minority of, of, <laughs> of the molecules and that the majority is broken down to nicotinamide first, which also can boost NAD. Um, and so that, that's not to say that it's not an effective way to get your NAD levels up, um, but it's, you know, not probably the, the synthetic route that's been drawn in a lot of these papers, you know, is, is not the major one in many cases. You know, in many cases, you actually see breakdown of the administered molecule resynthesis from a more primitive precursor. Right. Um, so, yeah, so I would like to dive into a little bit more detail on some of those. So what, one is, did you look at NMN and NR kind of separately? Did, do you have, without getting into the NMN and NR war, do you have any feeling as to which one would be more effective at boosting NAD? Yeah, so, 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 so there have been shockingly few head-to-head -head comparisons ever, right? Because as right. you alluded to, there's, there's a sort of feeling of two camps, you know, the, and, and because the experiments are expensive and people tend to, whichever one they get their hands on, do their experiments <laughs> because they're both NAD boosters and at the end of the day. Um, so you know, we've recently done some, some unpublished work on, on uh, kidney injuries where it seems like they're working almost equally efficiently. And that's the same thing we saw in, in the paper you mentioned where we did the tracer studies. We saw that NAD levels were boosted in kidney almost equally by the two. Um, and we see the same thing in liver. Well, the unusual thing that we saw in that paper, and I, I think the first major indication that there could be a divergence between the two molecules uh, is that in our hands, when you give intravenous dosing, so you actually get the molecules directly to the target tissue, mostly intact. Um, NR goes into muscle um, and heart also, which wasn't in the paper, but it does uh, much more effectively than NMN. Right, okay. And so I think this may be a case where, you know, there are enzymes that are required for processing. Um, to, depending on how you get the NMN in, there's an argument that you might need a, an enzyme that breaks it down to NR on the outside of the membrane, and then it crosses that way. And yes. so if you don't have that enzyme active, that you won't be able to get it into certain tissues. That, that looks like the case for muscle. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, so one thing you talked about was, and I suspect this is not a, an answerable question, but there's, you know, if you have enough NMN or NR, then you, you, over, you go beyond the liver's capacity to handle it and some of it will stay in the blood, right? It, it doesn't get converted down to nicotinamide. Do we have any idea? So, so I guess two things. So, so one is that would imply that you should take your NAD booster all in one go, because you want, if you, if you have a sustained, if you have a slow release, 
then you're not going to flood your liver. And the other one would be, do we, do we have any idea what that point is? Um, um, I think it's pretty high. So in some of these most studies, I mean, we're doing about 500 milligrams per kilogram, which is, you know, per body weight, much higher than you can go in humans. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, you know, and, and we're seeing still, a, you know, a very small minority sort of spilling over and being detectable as, you know, molecules that made it intact to tissues like muscle. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't know that we can define the threshold, but I think it's very high. <laughs> the liver has quite a capacity to vacuum these things up. Okay, so we think it's going to Okay, interesting. Yeah. And we say that actually, I should say, we, we, you know, we've been saying the liver and focusing on that because that, that's where we had data to begin with. But mm -hmm. some of this is, is happening in the gut as well, uh, based on newer data from us and, and others. So the, you know, the, the path when it goes in orally is the, the intestinal microbiome gets at it <laughs> for mm -hmm. a bit, then intestinal cells get at it, you know, secreted into the portal blood, then it goes through the liver. And if the liver lets it pass, it gets to the rest of the body. So we were sort of catching things at the liver and saying, you know, whatever intact molecules had made it that far seemed to be stopped in the liver in our hands. <laughs> but actually a lot of them are getting broken down before that by the my gut microbiome and, and, and intestinal cells. And so that, that collectively is sort of referred to as first pass metabolism, right? From, from right. your mouth before it <laughs> enters the main bloodstream after passing the liver and between that, you know, all the components of that pathway, very little is getting through, but it's right. not exclusively the liver stopping it. <laughs> okay. So interesting. So the other pathways, like the gut microbiome, and were you, so you were using tracing molecules. So did you look for them elsewhere or, or you only kind of look for them in the liver? No, we, we looked in, in other tissues as well. And that was, so what we saw, and we can explain that the tracer strategy here was to, to put heavy isotopes, right? So we can detect by mass spectrometry, the administered molecule compared to you know, the, the endogenous forms. And we put heavy isotopes on, on both rings of nicotinamide riboside. So there's a nicotinamide and, and a ribose, which is a sugar that are attached to each other. And they get broken down when you release nicotinamide, mm. you know, and then you synthesize NAD that has only one heavy isotope. But if you make it directly from the nicotinamide riboside that you gave, you get NAD with two heavy isotopes. And so we looked in a variety of tissues and sort of why we reached that conclusion was we could see some NAD with two heavy isotopes in the liver, mm -hmm. but not in any of the other peripheral organs we looked at. So muscle, heart, brain, fat, you know, you could see NAD that had one heavy isotope, which meant the nicotinamide was getting there and you were boosting NAD levels, but it wasn't because the nicotinamide riboside got there in most cases. Right. Okay. And then, yeah, because I was kind of assuming that it was the liver that was doing that conversion, but you, but as you mentioned, it, it could have been, it could have happened in the gut or somewhere else that that, that got, that NAD right. booster got spread up. Yeah. I mean, the liver is definitely finishing off the conversion, whatever, right. because some, some is making it to the liver. That's why we can right. see the NAD with two heavy isotopes in the liver, some of it. Some of it. Um, and that's yeah. being finished off by the liver and, you know, sort of only the breakdown product nicotinamide is being let back out. Right. But so, yeah. So one question. So nicotinamide um, is the kind of uh, the output. It, so if you have a sirtuin and it, it's using NAD, the output is nicotinamide NAM, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So if you, if you're uh, taking nicotinamide, so you're raising your nicotinamide levels, does that um, inhibit the sirtuin? So that, that's an interesting question for the field. So, so that model you know, is proven in, in yeast, right? You can manipulate nicotinamide levels and, and control sirtuins and, and right. you get a problem where you can, if you give too much nicotinamide, it stops the sirtuins. And in human cells and culture, you can give huge amounts of nicotinamide and inhibit sirtuins for sure. In vivo, there's tons of speculation about whether this happens. There, there's not anything I'm aware of that proves definitively that you've managed to inhibit sirtuins at an in vivo you know, achievable concentration of nicotinamide. Um, so I, I think that that's honestly an open question for the field. But what, what I will say is in our hands and in most people's hands, I think the level of nicotinamide that you get from administering nicotinamide is pretty comparable to the level you get from administering nicotinamide riboside. Right. So I think, you know, I think if it inhibits, it's going to be a problem for any supplementation strategy, not something that's unique to if you supplement with nicotinamide. Interesting. Um, so, okay, so I, I kind of understand that, you know, advice, it's, but it sounds like nicotinamide would be as effective in terms of boosting your NAD as taking NR or NMN, according to the research. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's been sort of the implication of a lot of the things we've done. Now, there's scenarios that, you know, it would imply that you could really need to use one of the other molecules, like, for instance, in heart failure, it's been pretty well documented now that nicotinamide phosphoribosyl transferase, which is the first enzyme that uses nicotinamide, is downregulated. And so the, the heart is, for unknown reasons, doing something kind of self-destructive. It has low NAD to begin with, and it's downregulating the enzymes that make NAD. And so with that enzyme out of the picture, you might have no choice but to use nicotinamide riboside or mononucleotide to bypass it and get the NAD pool back. Um, you know, and, and so we don't know to what degree this is happening you know, in, in different injury models. There may be uh, many other cases where NAMPT is actually the, 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 the phosphoribosyl transferase enzyme is, is actually limiting. And so you really have to try to get one of these other molecules there. Um, and we don't know, I mean, one of my favorite hypotheses is that, that that little bit that's spilling over the liver when you give megadoses of NR or NMN, it, you know, still may be effective. It may be that you need actually only a tiny dose to be effective, right? And it's that little bit that spills over that's actually biologically important in, in some of these right. assays. And so we're doing some experiments now to try to give much smaller doses intravenously and see if that actually replicates some of the benefits, which would support that model that that you actually only need a tiny bit of NR or NMN. It's just that orally dosing, it's so inefficient that you need huge doses that way. Right. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.